All good. Thank you very much um, for having me um, tonight in Sydney. Um, this evening, I would like to talk about, hey, how can we put SEC in, in DevOps and make it essentially DevSecOps? Um, a very short introduction about myself. I'm Matthias Madu, CTO and co-founder of Secure Code Warrior. Started my career at Ghent University, which is in Belgium, um, where I actually pursued a PhD in application security. With my PhD, I moved to the US, joined an at that time small company called Fortify. Um, Fortify was really, really, really good at finding problems in code, just like a lot of companies today. And um, they are really good in, in finding problems in code. Um, after seven years, I actually realized, well, it's actually very simple to find problems in code if you never tell a developer how to write secure code in the first place. And that's our vision. That's, that's our grand target with Secure Code Warrior. We would like to be the company that if you want to write secure code and you think like, hey, I have this project, I need to crank out an application and it has to be secure, you should immediately think about Secure Code Warrior in terms of training, in terms of tooling, in terms of whatever you need to, um, um, to produce that secure code. Um, that's our vision. That's what we're working towards. And we have to start somewhere, of course. So for today's, uh, today's talk, I would like to first talk about why or on earth are we still talking about security? Why is it still a problem? Why are we still talking about problems that were found long time ago? Then I would like to look at, hey, who's in charge of application security and what is he doing or was he doing and what should he be doing and how can we make that transition? And then I would like to talk about, hey, DevOps, what's important in DevOps? Um, um, I talk about pillars that, that, that are very important with DevOps and also how we can maybe tag security onto that already moving train, um, already moving thing, which is called DevOps. Ultimately, some conclusion, and hopefully you guys have um, questions, so please drop them into, into the question section in the, in the tool that we're using today, um, and I'll, I'll, at the end, I reserve 10 minutes to go through them. Let's start with the first um, um, statement over here, why on earth are we still talking about security? Um, if I look at screw-ups and if I look at failures, one of them that is really sticking out there that you've probably heard of is the Ariana 5 rocket. Um, less than a minute after the launch, they had to self-detonate the rockets. And with the self-detonation, $7 billion was lost. And even more problematic is was 10 years of work was lost. $7 billion, yes, an astronomic amount. But the fact that they couldn't spend another seven billion and have that same rocket launch tomorrow um, was very, very problematic. What really happened internally? It was a very, very tiny, simple coding mistake. Um, they tried to cram a 64-bit float into a 16-bit integer, and that was essentially the the, the parameter for velocity. So um, that didn't work, of course, at a certain point in time. After a good 30 seconds, it reached the end um, of the 16-bit. It went into an overflow. And an engineer for performance handling suppressed the error handling. That led to this catastrophic failure. Why am I telling something like that? Because NASA really learned from that experience. Um, at that point in time, NASA realized, like, hey, well, we, we cannot do this again. You know, we, we have to figure out what went wrong. And not really from a coding perspective, but really from how do we build code, how do we um, vet code, and how do we make sure that every line of code that goes into that rocket, it's, it's a one-time chance. You know, once you launch the rocket, the code just has to work. Real-time patching, I'm not sure how that, that works, but it just has to work. So what NASA did is they, they invested more into writing code, writing secure code. Um, um, I'm not sure if, if people are not on mute, but please um, put yourself on mute if you don't mind. Um, so they've invested more into writing code, and they essentially bumped the price um, to $1,000 per line of code in 2001. The average price at that time in other organizations was around 50 bucks that was spent on, um, on writing code. So they put some more processes, some more vetting into place, some more testing into place. They did way more for every line of code that went into, the, uh, into a rocket or into anything that goes to, the, to a space station or into space. As my good friend Bob Ross would say, and I can unfortunately not play the video because otherwise I have to unscrew this whole thing here and then I'm on mute. As my good friend Bob Ross would say, um, 
we do not make mistakes. We only have happy accidents. Um, I'm not sure if the developer had the same kind of feeling when he, he realized he was um, ultimately the cause of that Ariana 5 rocket. I don't think he, he thought about it in that way, but ultimately something good came out of it. Um, but sometimes glitches, you know, and bugs, they become features. Um, sometimes something good comes out of something bad. And, and, and another very good example is I really like Street Fighter 2. Street Fighter 2 is immensely popular, and it's immensely popular because of the combo. The combo was initially a glitch where um, a developer figured out if he punched twice, it was counted as one. They elaborated on that thing, and it became the combo, which made Street Fighter 2 immensely popular. In security, we also have like some super interesting features in the, into our code. For example, um, sometimes we have in our code features that allow other people to execute whatever they want on our database. They can modify our data in our database. They can view the data in our database. They can delete, update, they can do, they have total control of that database. Of course, I'm not talking about a feature, I'm talking about the vulnerability called SQL injection. And you may wonder now like, why on earth are we still talking about SQL injection? Isn't that long begun and over? Is this going to be a talk about SQL injection? Well, rest assured, this is not going to be a talk about SQL injection. The only point that I would like to make is SQL injection is super old. When we were decorating our office in Bruges, I found this XKCD, funny XKCD about SQL injection, but the back was even more interesting. It said, Merry Christmas, Matthias from Jacob in 2008. So I received that from my manager at Fortify. So. SQL injection was already a thing in 2008. We were already working on that. And the fact is, it was not new at that point in time. It was already 10 years old. It's from 1998 or around 1998. It's 22 years old. And today, we're still talking about SQL injection. Why on earth are we still talking about SQL injection? So is it still a real thing? You may ask yourself. You can say, well, you know what? We are long forgotten about SQL injection. Well, let's have a look at some data. I really like, you know, if you have data, let's look at some data because luckily we have it. Otherwise, you would have to go with my opinions, which may not be the best idea for this talk. So let's look at some data. One in three newly scanned applications has SQL injection in the last five years. The joke goes that two out of three do not have a database. 111 billion lines of code are written every year. 111 billion lines of code. That is an astronomic amount. And and it's true, right? We all need to write more features, more customer requests, more interesting things, more shiny stuff in our applications. Um, there's no software deleter in our organization. Do you guys have a software deleter? It's hard to find the software deleter. 30, more 30 times more expensive to fix problems late in the cycle than early on. Um, over here, what we tend to do, you know, is we only fix one in 30 problems in our code, you know, because it's so hard, it's so much overhead that we only fix one in 30 problems into, into, into our code in, that lands the bug tracking system. So maybe we should shift and we can actually fix 30 times or not introduce 30 of these problems. Yes, a breach costs a lot of money, almost 4 million. So let's have a look at why we are still talking about SQL injection. This is what we do today in our companies. If there is a, a query that is concatenated on the left-hand side and we give it to pen testers or we give it to um, uh, white hat hackers, reformed hackers, bug, bug bounty programs, and they come back and they say, oh my God, parameter one and parameter two, here is an attack vector. You are vulnerable to SQL injection through parameter one and parameter two. Well, immediately, this is going to be a priority for developers and they're going to fix parameter one and parameter two. If your static analysis solution comes back and says, if all the stars align and if everything goes right, then maybe potentially parameter three is vulnerable to SQL injection. At that point in time, what happens in organizations is you start a fight between QA, security, and your developers to figure out if it's really a problem. Knowing the answer is quite often irrelevant. Just, just fix it, you know, because quite often the fix is less work than starting the whole fight. But this is what we do. We want to figure out if it's really a problem. And if today nobody can tell if parameter four is vulnerable, um, then we are not going to fix that because it works from a functional perspective. It does what it was supposed to do. So we are just going to let this go through. Um, ultimately, you know, a new developer can come on board. We can create new paths in our application and parameter four can become a problem tomorrow. 
so I think I think this gives a really good simple overview why we're still talking about problems like like SQL injection or like any other application security problem. And to put this into a company perspective, let's see how we're really doing from a company perspective. Quite often, well, not quite often, I've never seen an empty bug tracking system. We all have bugs in our bug tracking system and some of them are labeled security problems. We ask the developer, can you please fix the security problems? And we give you exactly nothing as of help or actually very, very little. Why is that? Why do we give very little to our developers? Well, first of all, um, our application security team is super, super, super small. On average, it's one application security person per 100 developers. Think about 100 people. Have you interacted with 100 people this month? Um, now, imagine you have to lead and guide them and make sure that they write secure code on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, that is that is impossible, right? So it it's not that we that application security people do not want to help the developer. It's just the order of magnitude is way off. And even if you fix something, as we've seen initially, it costs it is thirty times more effort to fix a problem in code than to not make it in the first place. So it also requires a ton of overhead. You have to take the bug, figure out the solution, implement the solution, go to testing, go to QA, and so on and so forth, and, until it ultimately goes into production. Oh, last but not least, yes, um, and I'll, I'll definitely come back to that point. Security, our application security and developers in the old days, and we have to change that with DevOps, is that they talk completely in a different language. A developer is all about his code, his baby, features, functions, um, making sure the customer is happy. Security is all about, can I find this one problem over here that takes the whole thing down and then make it the developers its problem? That's definitely what was happening in the old days. So not really working together. What happens is, um, well, we use rankings. We're gonna rank our vulnerabilities, our problems in code, and we're only gonna fix the top X number, top 10, OS top 10, OS top three, OS top one um, problems in our code, and let's move on. There's no time for the rest. As I said before, we write 111 billion lines of code, so we keep on introducing new problems in code. Why? Well, some of these solutions can actually find 700 different categories of problems. So um, if, if there's not something that can help you while writing code, it's gonna be very, very hard to know every category of problem in this, on this planet. And last but not least, yes, there are the things that nobody is aware of today. There's no, not, it's, it's not found by tools, not found by people, not found internally, not found externally, but one day it will appear. I intentionally use the infinity loop because to me, this is a never ending story that we need to break. So how do we break that? How can we move to, um, 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 to a more robust way of working so that we essentially create secure code? To understand that, we have to figure out what application security, DevSec, software security, name it, what are they doing and what should they be doing? Well, today, um, the group that is responsible for creating secure code, their task, their ultimate dream is to deal with tough security questions and figure out like, hey, how can we really make sure that we can produce secure code? That should, of course, they're, they're, they're be their core task. Um, that, that is not their core task today. Um, they are constantly drawn back into common problems like the SQL injections of this world where they're like, oh my God, still this thing. Um, they are drawn back into, well, how do I build out a team? I'm one in a hundred, um, impossible. Can I hire talent? Where, where can I find talent? Um, um, quite often your talent is internally. You've, you look at your developers that are very well skilled in, in, in software security and, and you help them and you move them um, into application security or you even have satellites. So um, there's definitely a capacity problem over here. And yes, there's a hundred developers you know, that have problems and they're asking for help and you want to help them and, and you do long hours. So, so ultimately it leads quite often to burnouts and, and not being able to help anybody. There's a good part over here too. Application security is quite often well-funded. You know, um, they're, they're, they're quite often, the, the business understands that application security is important and they want to put more money into the application security in, in their organization. 
But as my um, good friend Notorious B.I.G. is saying, more money leads to more problems. Um, it's not because we have more money that we can instantly hire the people, fix our processes, um, and do whatever it needs. Because at the same time, there's also another reality, which is we're creating more code on a day-to-day -day basis, and that leads to more vulnerabilities. So what do we do with that? How, how do we tackle this problem? I think one of the biggest changes that we have to make, and it's, it's happening, uh, is really making sure that the security person understands code. And you would say, of course, the security people has to understand it. Hey, he, he has to help developers. Well, reality is it's not always like that. It's, it's, not, it's not really the case that application security people always understand code. Um, quite often, they know how to break the stuff. They know how to show you how horrible it is broken, but they are not able to help you fixing the problem. They are not able, they, they do not understand the technologies that you're using, the systems that you're using, the complexity that you have to go through. So we really have to move um, from, from application security just being you know, breaking stuff and, and making it developers' problems to really go over to the developer and say, hey, how can we help? How can we make this work? And I think the basics of all of this is that an application security person has to understand code or we are not going to go anywhere. So how do we create secure code today? Um, I, I initially had a slide where I said, you know, we're all doing DevOps. Um, reality is we all do waterfall and we're moving to agile and ultimately we hope to do DevOps. Um, but quite often um, people's DevOps cycles are just hidden waterfall models or something like that. So we have to we have to transition. Don't get me wrong. We have to transition from the old model where we just write code in silos. Ultimately, we deliver something, and then the, and the end user is like, "Well, well, did I really ask for that?" But that was six months ago. Um, that is not the reality where we are today. So we need quicker iterations, quicker feedback cycles with our developers. Um, and and yes, ultimately, it comes down to empowering the developer more. Key in this whole thing is the developer. And, and it's something that was very misunderstood 10, 20 years ago where, you know, the developer is just a person that has to implement the thing. No, 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 the developer becomes really a critical component in this whole um, um, ecosystem where it's gonna be a rise of the developer. The developer is gonna have, is, is more and more powerful in today's organizations in thinking about the solution and implementing that solution um, into their backend systems. So how can we put security in there? You know, there's one way of doing it and it's asking the developer, work faster, work harder, do more hours. Um, the reality is, well, um, developers have a job. Um, it's something that quite often is misunderstood, but yes, they have a job, which is creating features and creating applications that are nice and beautiful and do the thing that, that, that ultimately the customer wants. That is his job. It's not security, you know, because there, isn't there a security department? Aren't there security people? That, that's their job. But we have to get them on board because they write the code and we have to make sure they write secure code. So ultimately, what you want to do is we want to work smarter. We want to we wanna embed what we want to achieve into the developer, their processes, and, and not to, to be painful. No, we want to make sure that we help them. And, and that's also something that needs to change. The last five to 10 years, um, security was all about blocking, stopping the developer. That has to change. So where do I see really an opportunity over here? I think um, from a security perspective, we have to look at the developer and we have to figure out what are you using on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, what are you interacting with and how can we help you where you are? If you're in Jira, how can we help you in Jira? If you're in GitHub, how can we help you in GitHub? So we have to figure out a layer around everything that a developer is doing and give them something like just-in-time training, just-in-time help, um, just-in-time tooling. And yes, we need some ties into the operation side because it's very important to also um, uh, see what's really happening 
um, how customers are using the solution, what's failing, what, what's breaking, what's working, and, and have these feedback loop cycles into the development process so we have a nice overview. We have all the data, not, not, not you know, tons and tons of data, but we have to have the right amount of data to do our job. Yeah, of course, um, maybe there's there's an additional step that can be uh, embedded into here, which is, yes, I think on a continuous basis, we should make sure that the developer upskills himself um, and be aware of the latest new technologies, um, tech stacks, um, security, um, um, how to uh, security problems are essentially how to avoid these security problems. So in that whole DevOps cycle, we have to definitely make sure that we upscale our developers to the next level. So that made me think of, hey, so let's put security into DevOps. Um, what are the pillars for success within DevOps? And I didn't know myself, so I did a quick Google search. And it seems to be between three and nine pillars. If you have between three and nine pillars, you can be successful with DevOps. So that gave me a little bit the liberty of diving into all of these pillars when there was three or four or five or nine. And one thing I found very interesting was um, something called comms. So if you want to have, if if you want to be successful with with DevOps, um, there's a little bit of litera, lit, literature on comms, culture, automation, um, lean that came in afterwards, measurement and sharing. And I found that you know what I see in the market when when we go to customers, it it reflects with the reality. It, it you know it made me feel like yes, this is really what we need to do. Um, we need to have a culture change um, where everybody rallies around security and we want to be more proactive with security. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it's culture from a DevOps perspective. Um, everybody has to rally around it and have these rapid iterations and make sure that um, um, uh, we can do that, that our, that our, that our entire systems and, and culture is set up for that. Automation, we want to take the person out of um um, uh, for example, the deployment process. We want to do as much automation as possible. In DevOps, we've learned that um, the more manual involvement, the, the more problems we can introduce. So the more we can automate stuff, the better. Measurement is very important in, in, in DevOps. How can we measure our outcome? How can we measure that we're shipping code fast, that there are a lot of deployments? You know, what are, what are the metrics that we're going to put up? And ultimately, as just like today, DevOps is all about sharing. Um, however, DevOps is about sharing. Didn't we do sharing back in the day? Yes, we did sharing back in the day. I think in DevOps, the sharing has to be more smart sharing, more technology sharing, more sharing in the sense that it automatically comes to the right people. That it, there's not, you know, you create a document, you push that document somewhere, and hopefully someday maybe another developer will read that document. No. Sharing should be put into a different perspective. So if we go through culture, automation, measurement, and sharing, how can we actually put the security on top of that? So first of all, I think if we want to put security into the culture, it all starts with making sure that everybody in the organization rallies around security. It's just like the analogy over here like, that I like to make is it's like building a house. If at the end of the day, you deliver the house and all the wiring is faulty, well, it means there was not good communication and interaction between the different parties that had to build that house. And if you have to redo all the wiring, it's not starting from scratch, but it's gonna be a gigantic job. Same is true for security. All too often, um, my personal experience, management is blaming developers that they didn't produce secure code. While at the same time, you know, there are strict deadlines to deliver something. Yes, it has to work from a functional perspective and so on and so forth. So ultimately they were not able to think about how to engineer that from a secure, you know, in a secure way, from a secure perspective. Um, everybody in the organization has to acknowledge that if you want to write secure code, developers have to be given time um, to, to upskill themselves in how to write secure code and also apply that into their projects. That doesn't mean you know developers you know should do everything and and if they are given time it you know it, it's just gonna work no it also means that you have to make something for a developer that fits into what he's doing on a day-to-day -day basis um, does does a developer um, 
personal experience does a developer like to be in in meetings or in um day sessions of of training uh, maybe maybe not um quite often a developer wants to be le- wants to learn more through through um a platform through code sitting behind their computer in in a fun and engaging way. Um, so we have to make something that that a developer enjoys or at least fits um, in in what he likes to do. It doesn't have to be boring. At the same time, the developer has to understand that um, if he writes secure code, he is definitely above average. And and there's a very good uh, reasoning for that. Normally, if you start with coding you make mistakes like a semicolon or or you do not know the word kind of stuff. So you're all making syntactical mistakes. Um, once you are um, uh, 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 past that point in time, you try to think about algorithms. How do algorithms work? How do I make a function? How do I make components interact with each other? And, and once you pass that learning experience, then you can think about, oh, like, oh, there's something called security. Like some other people that are just misusing my code or just using my code to do other things. That That's quite interesting. So it's, there's a natural progression from, from, from a trainee to a junior developer to a senior developer to a very upskilled developer. Well, security comes at the end. So if you're a security savvy developer, quite often that means you're really above average developer. And that what we see in organizations today is that um, developers are then used to um, more interesting projects. You know, we have this special project. It has to be really secret and also secure because it's going to make a dent. We only want the best developers, the security savvy developers on there. So it's going to be good for a developer to understand that, yes, if if I, if I upskill myself in writing secure code, it's going to give me more opportunity. I, I like this one because it, it it fits where we are today with Corona, people working from home. If I look at my kids, um, you know, school is, you know, is cool, but there are other, there are other ways of learning. And, and I think we're going to see a drastic, drastic shift in how people learn, how young people learn. It has to interest what they're doing. Yes, my kids learn French in school, but they learn more French through Duolingo than they actually do in school because they like Duolingo and they don't like school. That was culture. Second one, automation. Um, um, how can we embed security into automation and ultimately make sure that we um, do not stop or block the developer? Um, first of all, there's an obvious one. Pick the tools that fit your technology and, and your culture and your stack um, you would say, of, of course, you have to do that. Well, it's not true. All too often we see organizations picking some tool for one group and then say, um, well, this works well for Java. The other people are JavaScript. Sounds similar. Let's let's distribute that same tool to the other people. They, they're going to figure it out. No, that's not how it works, of course. Um, second thing, automation is coffee test. I really like the coffee test. Um, security should embed as many um, uh, tests into the build as possible. So if they click a button um, and they say, do my testing, you should run as many you know tests as possible from a security perspective, but not too many. If you're back from taking a coffee, you should have actionable results. It should not run for hours and hours. So cram as many tests as possible from a security perspective in your five minute time. If you have more tests, well, either parallelize them or um, get them into the nightly build so that um, they are still ran on a day-to-day basis, but but you do not block the developer. Goes hand in hand with the third one: do not block the release. And and this may be very counterintuitive. Um, you you may say, of course, we have to break the release from a security perspective. Well, I I actually argue the opposite. Um, I argue that you should only block the release if you're a hundred percent confident. Um, I think we're in a state today where all too often we block developers where ultimately that was not necessary. So um, unfortunately, we have to reverse that step and say, no, we should um, let things go through. If something is fishy, you know, and you're, you know, you think it's, it, we should stop it. Well, make a sidetrack, do some rapid iterations there to figure out if it's really a problem. But ultimately, try to not stop the developer. We have to take a different approach. Integrate with 
um, um, and the fourth one, integrate with chat ops. What does that mean for me is um, my developers do not read email. If I send an email to one of my, my top developers, um, well, I hope I will get an answer within a week because I think he checks it once a week. If I send something through Slack, I'm pretty confident within two minutes I have an answer. So we should talk the talk of the developer um, and we should figure out what his world is like and integrate with, with what he is doing. Last but not least, use standalone containers. Um, same again, um, make sure they are standalone containers. There's no dependencies with other containers because if that other thing goes down, your stuff go down and it's again security that, that stops and fails and, and blocks um, whatever we're doing. Which leads to measurement. Um, and I'm gonna take two more minutes to finish that off and then I'll take uh, six minutes of questions. Measurement is really like, hey, um, what should we measure? And <laughs> interestingly enough, five, 10 years ago, application security was measuring how many problems can we find? Oh, today we have, so can we find on average 100 problems a month? Oh, that's fantastic. Can we find more? It's not helping. That That is not helping. That is not helping the end goal of your um, company, which is can we get our products fast and reliable into the market? So. Security needs to think about measurements that help the developer ship reliable code. And I can give you some suggestions here. How can security help with deployment frequency? Um, how can security help with lead time? I can also give you some things that we should not measure or we should avoid essentially altogether because if we're gonna measure it, it's gonna have an inverse effect. For example, mean time to failure, meaning can we lengthen the time in between two failures. Well, if you try to do that, if that is your objective, to not have security incidents and try to lengthen that time, what happens is that people will um, not come forward with problems, they will, not, they will hide problems, and ultimately that's gonna lead to more problems. So don't do that. Do not measure mean time to failure. It's the exact opposite. I'm not saying you have to measure how fast you can fail and, and shorten that time. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. But if you fail, a good measurement would be how fast can we recover? How fast can security, developers, everybody in the organization, if we fail, how fast can we get the system back up and running in a secure way? That is a good measurement. Last but not least, sharing. And I'm, uh, I like to talk about sharing, but I'll keep it very brief. Um, the days of writing papers are over. Um, it's no longer a stack of paper with problems that you're gonna give to developers. No, what we should do is we should capture um, um, knowledge from the developer and distribute that in a very sufficient way, of uh, effective way, sorry, in a very effective way. Because all too often what happens is when you check in code, when you fix a problem, that knowledge, the day you check it in and the day you close that bug is gone. Um, Nobody is gonna go back to that bug in the bug tracking system and say, oh, how did that work again? It, it happens very rarely, you know? Bugs that are closed are done, move on. That information is, is lost. So what we need to do is we need to capture that information not by writing it down in a paper, but through technology, through GitHub, or uh, through through um, um, uh, our, our our CI/CD, through our um, IDEs, um, in our pipelines, um, through our security tools, we have to capture that information and share that where it actually makes sense. And and I'm really a big fan of capturing information and giving developers, you know the just-in-time knowledge, the just-in-time information, the just-in-time training when they actually need it. That's how I think we fit with, with DevOps and how security can embed itself into the new way of working. With that, I would like to conclude my talk. I hope I was able to give you an introduction why we're still in this, in this loop, um, what a security person is doing today, and how we can actually put security into the culture, the automation, the measurement, and the sharing. Um, of DevOps. Let's see if I can stop my screen share for a second. And if I can go through some questions. With DAST tools, we can integrate for automation during 
security testing on the code. Um, with with uh, DAST tools, um, it's it's interesting. So there's, to me personally, there's the, there's the old way of working, the one time scan, um, and and I think. Um, organizations that are around for 10, 20 years, they, they are still in that model and they try to move towards, you know, can we do some more lightweight things? Can we do some more um, 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 interesting things and give direct feedback to the developer? I don't think they are quite there yet. There are some interesting moves in that area where um, there's also like a component sitting in, in the back that is monitoring the code and together with um, the external view and the internal view, um, you can actually give feedback to the developer. This is what we've seen from an external view. That, that's really the DAS side. And this is what we've seen from an internal view where we actually saw the breakage in um, the application. So that that's so I think there's a, a couple of good players in that area that, that move towards um, um, uh, being more integrated with the new way of working. With the introduction of the like ServiceNow, Salesforce, MuleSoft in the last few years, low code where an actual writing code lines has shrunk down to maybe one third or less. How does DevSecOps hold the significance or even possible? Um, so the question is, hey, there's, there's um, companies that um, make writing code um, um, very simple, but, but gives you less flexibility. Um, how can we hold up DevSecOps in, in in, in, in that regards, I think it's a two-edged sword um, where if if you only expose a minimal set of things, um, so ultimately, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that a different, uh, in a different way. Ultimately, it is um, a, a, a trade-off between security and, and functionality. The more functionality, the more you expose, Quite often, um, it's it's harder to get it right from a security perspective. The the, the less things you expose, the more restrained um, it is. It it is it is better to do that from a security perspective. That doesn't always hold up, but quite often there is a correlation between um, um, being very very flexible and from a security perspective. Yes, you can do more wrong with that, um, or or. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are being very restrictive and then you cannot do a lot of things wrong. So my stance on in general, regardless of, of ServiceNow, Salesforce, MuleSoft and so on and so forth, is if you have the opportunity to bake security into your frameworks, into your libraries, that is absolutely my top pick. Um, we should embed as much secure ways as possible so that the developer cannot make that mistake. Um, that is very, very good for um, new apps that we're writing. The reality is we have a lot of legacy stuff that we still need to integrate with and changing that is quite often hard and we still need to maintain, we still need to update that. Um, so so that's a little bit, you know, the trade off that we need to uh, work on. What is the ratio between the number of AppSec persons in an organization? If you say AppSec should know the code, let's say company has multiple language being used, like five. Um, very a uh, hard question to answer. Um, but if you look at BSIM, for example, over there, um, they have, so BSIM is, is people already thought about security and, and they interview companies that um, have um, a security group over there. It is close to two application security people per 100 developers. So for me, it highly depends in what business you are in, what and what groups you have. Um, I really hope if you're working on um, airline software and if you're working on automated car software, your ratio is very high. I really hope your ratio of having application security people per 100 developers is super, super high. I really hope that, you know, close to one in 10 is there. Um, but I think look at look at your projects and and and. Um, look at the projects that you have and figure out like how important it is. Um, I think even more so it's important to get your developers engaged and get the developers in in that story that, hey, um, we, we have to do it. So maybe a, a, a quick um, um, a quick increase of a lot of application security people to get something done in your organization and upskill the developers and make sure they start to share in a smart way is is probably the way to go. Um, so it's 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 hard to say company by company, software by 
uh, software by software, project by project. Maybe last one. Do I have time for a last one? I'll take the, the last one. How do you rate snick.io as um, serverless appsec tool? Do you have any other tools which are better? Can you suggest? Um, um, snick.io, um, there's in that in that space you have um, white source. Um, uh, GitHub ha has acquired a company. Uh, the name slips me now, and they're actually reworking that entirely into GitHub. So th there, there's a lot of companies that are trying to find um, um, or that try to warn you that there are problems in your third-party open source components. One thing I actually had a discussion yesterday on was the fact that um, there's, again, some... some um, they want to find problems, and they are rated based on how many problems they have found in... Uh, libraries. Well, at the same time, these these components they are sometimes labeled as vulnerable because there's one edge case function which nobody uses vulnerable, which gives you problems in selling your own software because they scanned it with Snake. So it's a market that is maturing to me. Um, it's a it's a market that uh, we're going to see more of. Uh, but there are some things that they still need to figure out because right now it's all based on let's find let's make sure. We find every nitty gritty problem and it's all problematic and regardless of where you're using it. So we, we need to look a little bit below the surface on how these, these components are really used in your application and if it's a problem for you. So if library X is a huge problem because there's one vulnerability in there, but essentially you're not using that in your application and, and you have no intention of using it and nobody is going to ever use that in your application, is it still a problem? I don't know. So it's... And I know it's 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 a conflicting thing, but it's a maturing market that that I'm very interested in follow up on following up on. 